not be the sunny, palm-tree-lined streets of Los Angeles, but the city of Nashua has its own batch of movie stars showing off their cinematic skills. Nothing lasts forever. So, we do everything we can to live life to the fullest. I want to go to college for it. I want it to be like my whole life. I love every bit of it. It's like my favorite thing. The Nashua Public Library held its first ever tiny film festival, bringing the community together and screening dozens of creative one minute flicks. But it was a fun challenge to try to think of something and kind of tell a whole story in a minute, which is pretty tough to kind of squeeze that in and get a good uh, video out. The Nashua Public Library's movie theater is the last real movie theater left in Nashua other than Chunky's. And our programming has evolved this year to reflect that. And to go along with that community feel, we thought, why don't we use this space to highlight community filmmakers and inspire people to make art. And through this festival, um, we had over 34 submissions. The only criteria was that the film needed to be under a minute and it had to be appropriate for all ages. Hi, my name is Roy. This is my lightsaber. Pretty cool, right? Uh-oh. Uh. Passionate filmmakers of all ages answered the call and all were invited to the library Oscar weekend for their own red carpet moments. I just wanted to say um, hi to my friends. <laughs> if you can imagine you're making a film at home alone and it's 60 seconds and you get to see, you know, the thrill of it being on the big screen but having an entire audience laugh or gasp. Um, you could tell for a lot of the filmmakers it was a really validating experience. Just any kind of thing that brings together people just making art is great. I think it just promotes creativity. Peter Fernandez and Ryan Grudinski oh took home first place great. in the adult category for their film, The Light. I've been here since Wednesday. Oh, they're picking me. I'm the chosen one. It was kind of like a struggle to figure out how much time the, the screen could be black, how much time this, the fruit had. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, getting, getting everything in in one minute is pretty tough. And we did have some jokes and stuff that didn't make it because it had to be a minute. I do love apples, but some, yeah. someone had to play the apple. Red and Simmons took home top honor in the ultra stacked and innovative team category. We think we have time. We never really know how long. And we can either focus on it running out or do anything to enjoy life as much as possible. It's a ton of stuff. Like, it's, it's days and days. It's coming up with ideas. And then you have to write everything, like, line by line what you want it to be. And then put it all together and film it and everything. It's a whole entire process. I was shocked. I wasn't expecting it because every, there's so many other like amazing films that were also produced. So I, I was really, really happy. <laughs> And Charlotte Kylie's Cameron the Therapist took home the trophy in the kids category. I was like really um, happy that everybody could see my um, video. Why don't we share our feelings? You go first. I feel like I get bullied by my friends at school and Cameron. Charlotte worked on the film with her sister Claire and said some parts of the process took a little longer than others. Like remembering the lines and she kept laughing during the filming so we had to cut and then redo it all the time. What's happening? <sighs> Who's there? The Nashua Library says that they hope that this will be an annual community event, and many of the winning filmmakers say they're already thinking about their next submission.
a building full of books. Is that what you see? Dusty shelves and old brick walls. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's something that transcends our differences and brings us together as one. I think there aren't many spaces in the community where you get to amplify people's voices and their art and give them a platform and then bring them all together to celebrate that. My mountaintop is home to only one and no other mountain could ever compare. My hands, my heart, my own. of what's coming up on tomorrow's Chronicle. New Hampshire Chronicle fans may hear this and think it's time for Fritz Weatherby. But no, this music comes from an extensive private collection of Thomas Edison's cylinder phonographs. That one right there is 1897. This one's 1898. Roger Daniels preserves the historic treasures in his music room at his old family home in Rumney. Every single phonograph from the late 1800s to 1912 works beautifully. Coming up, New York, LA, Peterborough? But first... It was nerve-wracking though because we didn't know if it was going to come back to life or not. It could have flipped over, it could have sunk, a shark could have gotten hit, like anything could have happened. Closed captioning is sponsored by Caesar Chimney. Call There you go, Sassy. <laughs> Sassy is two, a little toddler, and she's here to learn all kinds of tricks. Yeah, here at Copac Agility, they will teach you tricks, but they also have obedience classes as well for the new dogs out there, the puppies that need to learn just some of the basic commands. Right, Sassy? I'm sure you're well past that, though. 
<laughs> She's so cute. All right, next up, just sit right back and you'll hear a tale of a fateful trip that started from the shores of New Hampshire with a mini boat built by students here. They tracked their vessel for more than a year until it sent back a signal from a faraway shore. Gene Mackin shows us the amazing journey that created a new friendship in another land. This is the epic story of the high seas glory of the rye riptides, the mighty mini boat set afloat on an ocean tide. The legendary tale begins on the land at Rye Junior High School, where fifth graders dove into a challenge, crafting a small seaworthy sailboat. No crew on board, but a hull full of trinkets and treasures. A message in there to the whoever found it and a lot of different languages, which is really exciting. It was all hands on deck building the Rye Riptides mini boat until the pandemic sent this crew home. Determined not to let the ship wreck before it even got wet, the executive director of Educational Passages, the nonprofit that launches these mini boats worldwide, took the helm. It's kind of like a message in a bottle, but we're putting a GPS tracker on it so that students can see where their boat is going. Cassie grew up in New Hampshire. My love for the ocean started right there at the Isles of Shoals as a little girl tide pooling. A childhood field trip to the Seacoast Science Center in Rye led to a job here later, and now to an ocean honoring organization. Our mission uh, is to connect people around the world to the ocean and each other. She teamed up with fifth grade science teacher Sheila Adams to deliver the mini boat to the docks in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. We were already looking at patterns in nature and looking at hurricanes and then we also studied weather, how weather would affect the oceans and the currents, the atmosphere. The crew of the Sea Education Association, a floating classroom, took this precious cargo on board and out into the Atlantic. In October 2020, with a heave-ho, off she goes. The five-and-a-half-foot rye riptides was launched into the Gulf Stream. The captain logged the departure, writing, there was a fair bit of breeze and the vessel charged right off, looking jaunty. Back home in New Hampshire, the students monitored their mini boat by GPS. And then it looped and no, it was on the right here. Off. Yeah, and then no, here. I would track it every day in science class, see where, see what progress it made, see where it would uh, go, because you really never knew where it was going to go. If you guessed, it would just go in the complete opposite direction. The GPS report was reporting every six hours, so they were making predictions. They were using some tools to study ocean currents and weather. Then, in September of 2021, after almost a year at sea, rye riptides went dark. It was nerve-wracking, though, because we didn't know if it was going to come back to life or not. It could have flipped over, it could have sunk. A shark could have gotten hit, like anything could have happened. Four months of silence drifted by. Then suddenly, a signal. Rye Riptides reporting in. I was like, completely caught off guard by that. I'm like, whoa. Whoa is right. Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I'm zooming out, I'm zooming out. Where is this thing? Norway. I could not believe it. The Arctic Ocean. Can it get any better? It was like, can it get any better? This was, it just got better and better. 462 days at sea, more than 8,000 miles traveled, rye riptides marooned on an uninhabited rocky island off Norway. A nearby family went on a rescue mission equipped with longitude and latitude. A sixth grader named Corell found half the boat. Honestly, it looked like a piece of like scrap that you'd find at the beach, like after like a giant storm. It was dripping in barnacles. Yeah, they like scraped it off. They said and it was like smelled really bad. Anybody could have found it, but 
Uh, Corel found it and he got to bring it to his school and so we got to meet his school. Students here watch students there retrieve the souvenirs sent from New Hampshire. A class picture, coins and maps, leaves from seasons ago and letters all about the boat's home port. Our little piece of paradise is eight miles along the coast. And the classroom zoomed across the waters. Greetings from the United States. My name is Mr. Booth. I'm a science teacher here. We had the boat and uh, it's <laughs> torn apart. It's broken. A big part, a big chunk has fallen off. So much fun to, to open the boat and to see what's inside and start a friendship with you. A chance to chat with Corel. Maybe half of the boat was gone. <laughs> and ask each other questions. We were wondering what it's like, like what the weather is in Norway. The weather here is uh, cold. <laughs> Do you guys have homework? Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now the students in New Hampshire and Norway keep in touch as pen pals. And that is the epic story of the high seas glory of the rye riptides finding her way to a distant shore, connecting these friends forevermore. Anything is possible that our little boat, like it travels across the ocean. One thing I learned was to never give up. If something isn't going great, it can turn around and it can have a good outcome in the end. This is the latest photograph I have on the walls of my study. I found this picture, the Library of Congress. Cut it off the internet. All these young men and women in what appear to be swimsuits posing on an outdoor stage. The central figure right here, an older female, that's none other than Ruth St. Dennis, the most noted American dancer of the 1920s. Photograph has real zeitgeist, is a word. In the 1960s means something that captures the spirit of a time. In this case, time is right after World War I. Look at all those bobbed hairstyles. Amazing. You know, the most beautiful silent movie star of the time, in my opinion, was Louise Brooks. And Louise was a student of Ruth St. Dennis and her partner, Ted Sean. The Dennis Sean dancers came from Los Angeles, and they had a school in Manhattan. But in the early 1920s, the Dennis Sean troupe operated in Peterborough, out on the same road that today's Peterborough Players Professional Summer Theater is. This was the Mary Arden Summer Theater, the first outdoor playhouse in America. Creation of a socialite who lived nearby, and it was named for her and Shakespeare's Forest of Arden. Mary Arden was known all over the country. Paul Robeson, the great tenor, appeared in Eugene O'Neill's The Emperor Jones there. O'Neill himself, by the way, was once at the McDowell Colony, the artist colony. McDowell abuts the Mary Arden property. Broadway actress, movie star Marilyn Miller was out there. Bette Davis, Betty Davis, got her start on the stage of the Mary Arden. And, as I say, Louise Brooks was a Dennis Sean dancer. And now, by the way, there's a movie in current release right now entitled The Chaperone, first major film written by Julian Fellows, and he's the guy that wrote Downton Abbey. This film's worth seeing. The Chaperone is the story of a young Louise Brooks. Betty Davis is not, by the way, in this photograph, but you know, along with Ruth St. Dennis, we have right here, that is the great American dancer Doris Humphreys, and this gal right in the front is a very young Martha Graham. Wow. When we come back, your hometown weather.
Casa Trains, Ordinary People.